Welcome everybody. Uh, today we're going to be talking about page builders in the age of Gutenberg. So, um, page builders, when I talk about page builders, I talk about the stuff that was around before Gutenberg, uh, like Deer Builder, Old Grid, Elementor, Divi. Divi, thank you. Site Origins. See? There's a lot of them. Anyway, so what we want to discuss is their place. Stop being rowdy. Sorry. <laughs> you need to get uh, some strangers up here so we don't talk to each other. <laughs> so yeah, we're going to talk about what what the um, what the place of page builders are now that Gutenberg is essentially um, uh, a page builder. So. Uh, I'll introduce myself, uh, then I'll let the panelists introduce themselves, and we'll go over a little bit of ground rules, and then we will be off to the races. <laughs> yes, there will be rules. <laughs> rules. Order. <laughs> Let's talk about that. Uh, okay, so uh, my name is Matt Graham. I am a freelance web developer. Um, for a little bit of background, I do use uh, Beaver Builder. Don't hold that against me. Um, for a lot of my work, although I do do a lot of um, like very heavy customization, even beyond what Beaver Builder can do, so uh, kind of just speeds along development. Anyway, uh, I've been working with WordPress for six years as a developer, and I've been using it as uh, a platform for about ten. All right, I'm Nick Adams. I'm the COO at WP Buffs. We're a WordPress maintenance and support company. And um, I've been using WordPress since 2009, and uh, yeah, used page builders starting with uh, Visual Composer, and then moved on to uh, Beaver Builder. And I've used all the other ones, including Gutenberg. And uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm excited to have this discussion. I'm Michelle Ames. I am the head of customer success for Impress.org which is, uh, you might know, give WP, that's us. Uh, so we deal with a lot of our customer issues, and one of those is how to implement our plugin using Gutenberg and other uh, page builders. My background is, and you can hold it against me if you want to, because I build beautiful sites. But I, uh, my background is in Divi, so I use Divi almost exclusively. But um, I have used the others too. The only one I don't think I've ever used is Beaver Builder. Hey, uh, my name is Mike Demo. I am the community evangelist for Bold Grid, which we make a bunch of WordPress plugins, and we're probably most known for our page builder and our uh, WordPress onboarding experience. And I like how everyone has to like, you know, is adding classifications. Well, I use page builders, but but I customize it, so it's okay. It's not a dirty word. No, no. You know, it's just tools are tools. Don't exactly. Be That's right. <laughs> All right, so a little bit of ground rules. Um, I have a bunch of questions that uh, I took, uh, basically polled some people on the WordPress Canada Slack. Um, so we pulled a bunch of questions together. I'm not sure how long those are going to take. I think there's seven or eight of them. Um, but there is a link up there. If you go on there and you think of a question, it doesn't have to do with anything we've talked about already. It can, it doesn't have to. Um, Put your questions. I will. S oh, look, someone's already put one in. Sweet. Okay, I've never seen it work before. Um, all right. So, yeah, exactly. All right, and so, um, and if we get to a point where there's no more questions on the screen, I will ask if you want to talk and ask a question live. Cool. We good. You good? All right. Let's start. First question is, if you if you already use a page builder on your site, would you consider switching to Gutenberg? Yeah. As of right now, that's uh, mostly a no, and that's only because of the um, ease of use right now. I think that uh, Gutenberg has a ways to go with uh, user interface, and so once they get there, I think it has definitely some potential. However, for a site that maybe doesn't need um, a full page builder with you know multi columns and um, you know some of the drag and drop. I think yeah, I would for a page that doesn't need the. Yeah, I wouldn't convert anything that's currently in a page builder because that's just Herculean to try to move everything from one kind of builder to another. So 
I would, um, like Nick said, if I was doing a new build, I would, well, if I was doing a new build that I didn't have to have it done by tomorrow, I would, <laughs> because I haven't, I haven't dug in enough to convert to have that learning curve where I can just, um, you know, move quickly within it. Uh, but if I was doing a new build where I had some time to work on it, I would definitely embrace the word, or I should say the block editor, I think that's actually what it's called. Um, I would use the block editor and see how much I could do and how far I could go with it, uh, especially with the plugins that I enjoy using to see how they integrate with the block system. No, um, it's funny because, yeah, I probably would if I was new to the WordPress community. <coughs> I look at Gutenberg as I look when, uh, you know, Joomla went from 1.5 to 2.5. Yes, I don't talk about another CMS in here, but hear me out. Because that's how I look at Gutenberg. Because they had a plugin called the Legacy plugin, which meant older plugins that were meant for the Joomla 1.5 series would work in Joomla 2.5. So all these plugin developers were like, oh, we worked with the Legacy plugin. Our stuff works with the Legacy plugin. There was always this big battle. Are you going to convert to the new framework or not? And you know who used the Legacy plugin? People that were in the Joomla community ahead of time. You know who never used the Legacy plugin? New users to the community. Because if you're a new user and you're looking at a theme and you're looking at one that is compatible with new stuff and not, why would you pick the, the not stuff if you're just coming in? And yes, the block editor is new, but it's the future. We might not agree with the future, but it's what the project has said we're going. So I would always encourage new people to learn the new standard. And what's nice is page builders can work inside of those editors in different ways, depending on how you want to interact with them. So. When starting a new word, Michelle, you already touched on this, but we'll go over it again. When starting a new WordPress site, what considerations would you take when choosing between a page builder, Gutenberg, or the classic editor alone? Which one would you choose? Um, so really, I look at, at that from a content architecture standpoint. Um, if all they are wanting is just like a page with just basic um, basic parts on it that aren't too complicated of a layout, um, or they don't want a whole lot of content in general, I would go right with Gutenberg. You know, if they're starting a new site, I wouldn't even install a page builder. Um, it's as soon as they want something where they can um, really customize it. They have, um, you know, like specific design situations that they need to meet, that's when I um, would install, uh, personally, Beaver Builder, um, but the other ones are all kind right. of fair much. Yeah. <laughs> um, he stole my answer. So basically I was going to say the same thing, that it, if my answer to things usually is it depends, and it depends on what the site needs, it depends on what the user needs are. Um, sometimes it depends on the plugins and whether the plugins are compatible um, with which builder you're looking at, whether they're only compatible in Classic, um, which most of them shouldn't be now, right? Because we moved so far forward with WordPress. Uh, but also how they interact and how those things work. So I guess it really does depend on what the needs of the customer are. Did anybody take for you? <laughs> uh, basically, it is dependent <laughs> on, what, what, on what the goal of the site is. I mean, I think the biggest issue with any CMS, WordPress, Drupal, Drupal, whatever, is that people are too reliant on apps. Phones have ruined like the website, the CMS experience. We're, we're installing plugins for everything. And people forget what the core does. The WordPress core does a heck of a lot. And a lot of people don't know half the stuff it does because they're always going to their favorite plugin and that's security risk and weight and overhead. If you don't need a plugin and you know a page build is a, a plugin, you don't use one. Now, if it, it gives you efficiencies, like you can only bill so many hours, it's going to take you 10 times less time, well, that's a reason to use it. But the core is a lot of power, and I think we forget what the core has. And so I would just kind of look to see what the purpose of the site is and then make your decisions from there. Because it's never one size fits all. Like when I hate it when those themes that you buy pre-install like 40 recommended plugins. Like I was reviewing for um, a newspaper that's going to write a write-up on uh, like this business consulting theme. And it came from like WooCommerce, and it had no theme. It, it, it didn't have any hooks in the WooCommerce at all, but it was just part of the package. And it was like, why? It doesn't need to be there. So be as lean as possible, even for the reason. And look at the core, because a lot of people forget the core is there for a reason, and it 
does stuff. All right, actually, there's one question here that um, seems to kind of stem a little bit from that. So, a little bit of preamble. In, in my experience, it's from Amanda. Uh, in my experience, it's been tough integrating Divi and Gutenberg. I end up reverting back to the Divi editor due to spacing and overall user experience issues. I want to start using the benchmark. Oh, it meant to be the Berg. Oh, the Berg. Okay, the good. Thanks. Sorry. I'm correct for the win. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so the bird, more than the bird. However, uh, which page builder would you recommend using in conjunction with Gutenberg? Well, let's start with Mike <laughs> because I know he's got an answer. Uh, yeah. So both makes completely compatible with Gutenberg. Yay. Um, let's throw other ones out there. Here's my stand on Volvid. Is Volvid had blocks before they were cool. You know. <laughs> We have over half a million block designs. We've had them for two and a half years. And what's nice about us is you can easily flip between the goots, which that's the shorthand, not the oh, word, okay. the goots. Well, the goots. Yeah. You can switch between the goots, the bold grid editor, which lays on top of that, or the classic editor, and you can make it default for posts or pages or at ad hoc. So, um, and some of the other page builders also have Gutenberg compatibility. But the nice thing is most of them are free. So just spin up a bunch of demo sites. And if you need a demo server, you go to bulgur.com. <laughs> no, no, seriously. This is true for anything. Regardless of what plugin you use, bulgur.com has free demo servers that you can install anything on um, and spin it up in less than five seconds. You don't even need to make an account. Um, so if you, want, if, you want, if you want to test a theme or a plugin on the repo, you can just literally click the plugin or the theme and it auto installs. So if you want to just test all the page builders and you don't want to deal with local environments and you don't want to spin up staging on your host, just spin up throwaway accounts that, that you don't care about and just play with them and find one that works for your workflow. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> for all your demo needs, go to the Bulger. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, seriously, I think that there's, that there's a lot of solve that page builders don't or vice versa? Uh, let's start ladies first. Well, it depends on what your page builder is. <laughs> <laughs> but I will say, um, we, if you don't have to, like, was it say you don't have to install a plugin for everything, right? Yeah. So if you don't need to use a page builder, then you have less bloat. So there's less to worry about working and less that can misfire and one less plugin that has to be updated that can break your site, etc., etc. So it kind of solves that problem with not having to, not needing to do that. Um, I haven't played with it enough to know if, as it compares to Divi, if I can get the exact same layouts with Gutenberg that I could with Divi. So I really can't compare that way. But I would say, um, you know, it just depends. <laughs> <laughs> it depends, Trevor. Yeah. That's why I, I mean, I'm known for saying that at my meetup too. Every question is like, well, it depends. It does. It really does. It does. So I will say that the one thing it does solve is it brings um, hardcore JavaScript developers into the WordPress space in a more familiar way, um, whereas a lot of page builders were um, very dependent on PHP still. Um, and they, they definitely integrate JavaScript, but, um, but Gutenberg was built on, um, you know, on the kind of cutting edge um, JavaScript library so that like you're really there um, and there's something to offer for JavaScript developers who may not have known WordPress, but as it's continuing to take over the web, they've said, this is my chance to get into it. This is my chance to start developing. Um, to me, it is the end of short codes. And that's the vision, right? And that's, as a plugin developer, that's, that's, that's my dream. Because short codes are evil. 
Um, no, seriously, like, think about it. Like, um, how many times have you edited a client site and you have 40 short codes and like three paragraphs of content? And then if you try to migrate away to something else, it's a lot of work to get away from the short codes. Also, short codes slow down the sites as they have to parse the information every single time. Um, and it was, it was the short codes were hacked away around the tiny MCE limitation to get information um, inside tiny MCE when it loaded on the page load. And what's nice about the new editor is in addition to all the JavaScript, it has a lot of technical improvements that we can just hook into this data um, through the Gutenberg block system, but you can use it in other ways. You don't have to use it in the Gutenberg block if you're a plugin developer. And you, your people can, your clients and your users can see visually what might be in that spot because short codes are confusing for a lot of users. It's just like, yeah, don't touch that text, just trust me. <laughs> and that, at, and I've seen pages with 60 short codes on it, and that's just, they have a place for certain situations, but they're being abused right now as just a happy way to get around the, the way the classic editor or Tiny MCE did it. And I like from an architecture standpoint how Gutenberg is helping uh, plugin developers that fully embrace it, and it's a slow process, but in five years it's not going to be a thing anymore because it's just the beginning. Um, I, I'm excited about that feature because then we can have a more streamlined editing experience. It's also really good for blog posts because I personally am not a fan of full function page builders for blog posts. I think they're kind of overkill because the content should be the thing, not, not, not the layout. Um, I think they, um, it is a good place for it in posts as well. So. Touched on 
you touched on devices, so that should both, that I think all of you talked about mobile in some way. But um, what is, uh, I'm going to expand on the question a little bit, I'm not sure who posted well, it. Uh, but what, uh, what importance does, do page builders or even Gutenberg have in terms of mobile? Because I'll give you a little bit of background for myself. I do a lot of web designs that are very intricate. And they always design for desktop. And then it gets shrunk down to mobile. It's like, that doesn't look good. You've got to tell me what you want with it. <laughs> so uh, I have my opinion. Um, you know what? I'll get mine. I'm not supposed to be the MC, but I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to let the Canadian talk for a minute. Um, <laughs> Um, so, uh, as I said, I get a lot of designs that are very intricate and on mobile, they just don't think about what that looks like. And I mean, nine times out of ten, no matter whether you're using a page builder or any kind of uh, display framework like Bootstrap or, what's the other big one? That foundation, the name of what? Foundation? Foundation, thank you. Um, they all work on a grid that when you go to mobile, by default, just gets stacked. And that may be fine if it's just text content, no problem. But when you're talking about images that are supposed to you know, meld together in some way, and you put them like that, it's like, no, it doesn't look good. Um, so when it comes to page builders, it doesn't really matter because page builders are supposed to be a nice, easy way of doing multiple columns and you know, intricate layouts that don't work on mobile. Um, where Gutenberg, I think, really shines is the fact that it's just, it's, it's, it, it's not, um, by default, it's not like a layout thing, it's more of a different piece of content thing. And stacking it makes sense. That's my two cents. They're my two cents. So who wants to start? Or take over? Of course. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, first off, um, some page builders do have mobile responsive views, um, like in our version of the editor, which is this built on TinyMC, you can choose between tablet, desktop, and mobile and see that in your editor. But um, I think it goes back to a different point, is that you know a lot of people are stuck with like that bootstrap or grid mentality, where it goes to a single column, where you know if you're designing, you need to think about the user experience and how they're interacting with your content and who the user is. Um, I was talking to someone who was designing for, you know, third world mobile devices, like screen, like not even smartphones, just like old phones, and the, the page was 50 megs. And that went lower on the 2G connection, period. Um, so you need to think about not just visually, but kind of what the user experience is. And like we've all done the things like where we're trying to check the sizes and we grab the corner of the browser, we drag it and it breaks at a certain point and then the developer's like, well, that's not a real display size. Well, yes, it is. Look, it's here on my screen. <laughs> yeah, but no device has that size. Yes, it does right here on my screen. So um, you have to just think about what the user experience is at the beginning and not try to shoehorn in mobile at the end. Um, when we were doing agency work, we were focused on the experience and we did that by writing story points on what is the goal of this project try to fulfill that goal. And there's ways you can kind of cheat it. Like you can hide and display certain blocks on certain display sizes that make the content not completely big. But um, uh, I read that question as something different. How does it change, in my mind, it was how does it change the editing experience is what I heard when that question was read. And um, I don't think page folders or Gutenberg are great for mobile editing, period. Um, I think the WordPress, honestly, the WordPress app that Automatic puts out for mobile publishing is the best out there for just on-the-go editing the content because we're trying to add a blog post on WordPress on your phone natively is just pretty annoying. So if you're trying to add content on the go, I recommend the Automatic app. But for display, you just gotta, gotta, kinda gotta think about it because I don't think it matters what tool you use. I think you just kinda have to have it in the forefront and service to the purpose of the site and not try to force <coughs> mobile into a site. Don't wait till the end to look and see what it looks like on your phone. <laughs> Be mindful of it as you go. Check yeah. on your phone, actual phone. 
Yeah. And your actual phone, yeah, it's not yeah. just like not, our phone. Yeah, and not on Wi-Fi. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I'll say at this point, um, the data has proven that overwhelmingly um, mobile is the future of the internet. Um, my 96-year-old grandmother does not have a computer, but her experience of websites is entirely mobile. Um, so it's not a generational thing anymore. Um, we're talking like my uh, my my other grandmother. Everything for her is on on her iPad. She uh, you know she goes to websites all the time, never on a computer. Um, and so at this point, if you're not starting, if you're not mobile first in your design, uh, I would recommend that you check that out. If you start considering that, um, you know, look at mobile because um, I would guess that probably in five to 10 years, most, if not all of your traffic is probably gonna come uh, from somebody on an iPad or, an, or on a phone, uh, you know, or a tablet or on a phone. Um, and you'll still get the occasional uh, desktop user. Um, but that's just kind of where things are headed, especially um, as other parts of the world are developing. Um, nations that were previously um, developing are now developed and so um, what they, they've skipped the whole laptop or desktop thing entirely, and everybody's just getting a tablet. Everybody's getting a cell phone. Um, so that's the way to go, is, is really build things for the mobile web, and then you know, figure out what your desktop experience is gonna be after that. Um, but really focus on the, on the mobiles, because that's where everything's gonna be headed, and it's a great state of mind to get into. Learn mobile deeply. <laughs> All right. And look at your um, your navigation bar too, because you can design on a, on a desktop or you can design on your laptop, and everything fits your navigation properly. And as soon as somebody's looking at it on a laptop, a little bit smaller than yours, then your navigation wraps and it's not breaking like it's supposed to. And I'm seeing more and more sites that are using hamburger menus, regardless of where they are. So that mobile menu experience is something that's really going to take over as well. And it happens on all sites, so not the call right. out. But, I mean, yeah. this, this breaks on mobile. On the, the menu breaks on the Hamilton website, and you know maybe, and it still kind of has a hamburger as a side menu on the side as well. So um, it it's just something you got to think about, and it's all user experience happens a lot because you know like my biggest pet peeve with WordCamp websites because I go to a ton of WordCamps is I hit the website on the, on my phone and I try to find the venue and the dates. Yeah. And half the time, this is nice because the date's at the top. You know how many word camps don't have the date on the front page? Um, and you know how many, and the majority of camps don't list the don't list the address of where the camp is. Like, and that is going back to user experience. How are people going to be interacting with this content? And they're interacting different because on the mobile phone, they probably need to find the session information, the location, the times, and that's what they need now, which might be different than desktop, which may be spawn, you know, may want to be about the sponsors. And if you're building a site for, I know we're getting off track a tiny bit, but if you're building a site for a brick and mortar, like a restaurant or a store, <laughs> then having phone numbers and hours of operation on the homepage is super important as yeah. well. So. Yeah, absolutely. All right, next question. Why would a user want to use both a page builder and Gutenberg on the same site? We had to touch on this a little bit. Um, because it depends on the <laughs> Exactly, it depends. We're not talking about the diaper. Um, <laughs> Well, not yet, but I don't yeah, anyway, sorry, <laughs> I was kind of um, No, I mean, uh, uh, I'll step in a little bit too. Um, when it, uh, I think it was Nick that you said, like, when it comes to a blog post, or was it? No, it's demo. No, it's demo, sorry. <laughs> I'm getting everyone confused. Um, no, when it comes to a blog post, you don't want to have uh, really intricate designs. It's, it's about the content. Um, yeah, the page, uh, a page is uh, it's more static, uh, can have lots of different information on it, but usually a post is, is, is kind of focused on one subject, and it's focused on the content, not about what it looks like. You know, you're not trying to wow people with, with the design, you're trying to wow people with what they're reading. That's funny. Okay. Uh, let's go Nick, because he hasn't started in a while. Um, I actually, um, you know, even though we kind of already answered this, the one thing I will say is um, I think it all depends on the individual, the content of the individual page or post. 
Because um, I've seen great things where people have blog posts, including like New York Times has done an amazing job with their long form blog posts that just have fantastic like CSS3 transitions um, and all sorts of stuff um, that really just kind of gets you drawn into the content and it almost you get like a, an emotional response to what they're building. You get excited as things kind of like ease in. and um, So really just look at what your goal is. Um, I always recommend um, planning things out. Uh, Shanta will tell you, uh, post-it note, as you, as you build, um, you know, it's all about the planning. And so look at it and say, what's the right option? Because um, it's never going to be a one-size-fits-all for anybody. Um, so look at, look at your content and say, you know, does this need a page builder or does this need uh, the blog editor? Um, and maybe the answer is it, it could use either one. Maybe the answer is um, this one just needs some, some text or maybe there's even a feature that's in a block with things like atomic blocks and code blocks. We're now seeing uh, unique features in, in the WordPress block editor that maybe you've got something that's in there that's not available in a page builder. Just you know, look at what your needs are, look at what the needs of the content are, mm -hmm. and choose that way. And I would add that just because you can doesn't mean you have to. Mm -hmm. So just because you have the ability to use Divi or Beaver Builder or whatever, doesn't mean that you need to. I've seen so much over design over the years just because people want to play and want to use the features that are offered to them. That's great for fun, just like to play with, you know, on the background, build yourself a sandbox, have at it. But if you're building a customer or client site or you're building a, a site for your own business, make sure that you're designing for the end user in sight, not just because you want to play with sliders and different blocks and, and over designing it. You want to keep it simple, you want to keep it so that people are finding the information that they need and finding the content that's relevant to what the search is. Yeah, well, it goes off topic of the question, but like, on what you guys said, but you're not building a site for you. You're not building a site for your client. Exactly. You're building a site for their users, and I guarantee it, your client doesn't know their users as well as they think they do, and I guarantee you, you don't know their users as well as they think they do. And go back to the purpose of the site. Have in writing what the purpose of the site is. I met someone who said, hey, I have this client, they want to reduce bounce rate. And, and, and sorry, they want to, they want to change bounce rate and time on site with two KPIs. So I thought, oh, you want to reduce the bounce rate and increase the time on site. They were like, no, we want to increase the bounce rate and reduce the time on site because they were a government utility that valued if we were designed well, people can find the question in the first Google and get it and leave. And so don't assume you think you know what the purpose of the site is just because they're a store. Ask the question. And the way I word it is is what will define success of this project in a binary fashion that we can look in a year from now and have everything of you focus on that goal. And if, do, if it doesn't, it's just for it's, if it's just to make it look nice, a year from now that client's not gonna care. How many times have you had a honeymoon period where the client loves the site, six months goes by, and it's not doing enough? Well, it's because you didn't have those conversations ahead of time. So I'm going to rephrase this question slightly, uh, but um, should page builders continue to be a separate entity, or should they start integrating within uh, the WordPress page builder or the block editor um, and add their functionality to the block editor? I'll take this one to start. Absolutely, they should be separate right now. Once. Uh, once the block editor has a better UI, um, I will 100% agree that it's time to move everyone into a single space. Um, but right now, when I hand somebody a brand new site um, who's not familiar with, um, with like WordPress or anything like that, and I give them Gutenberg or I give them um, Beaver Builder, they can figure out Beaver Builder in about five minutes. Uh, it'll take them an hour before they say, forget this on Gutenberg. And unfortunately, it's just because it's not an intuitive interface right now. Um, but so right now, it's just easier to say, OK, just go right right into Beaver Builder, um, build this thing, and they can figure it out because it's drag and drop. Um, the setting up columns is an option marked columns. 
Um, so really it's a matter of interface right now for me, where I just find Beaver Builder is just so easy for me, no technical experience. Um, and hopefully Gutenberg will continue to uh, improve on the UI and um, be more intuitive, and then, then I would love to see more of them move into you know, having like a Beaver Builder block instead. I agree with that. I think that right now they do need to be separate but equal, so to speak, or at least somewhat balanced. <laughs> but um, you made me think of something that I forgot it just as quickly, but I, I think that it's important to remember, you know, again, back to what design, what, what it's for, and so you have to use the tools that you need to get the job done. So if it doesn't do it right now. The other thing I remember I was going to say, so I was on Reddit in the WordPress subreddit, and I saw so somebody ask a question about what were your thoughts on Gutenberg, and I said, I don't have a problem with Gutenberg, I just wish that there were lines around the block so that you could visually see them better without hovering over them so you had a better visual outlay of what you're doing. And somebody's response was, oh, there's a plugin for that. And I thought, there shouldn't be a plugin to make your, to, so that you can use your editor better. And so until they are, you know, make it more intuitive and make it easier to use that way, I don't want to be adding plugins so that people can use the editor. So, um, so yeah, so I, I still agree that they should stay separate for now. It depends. <laughs> <laughs>
can drag a forward testimonial and a three column, and then they've built a whole site with our pre-made layouts very similar to Divi. And that they do exist for the Gutenberg core. You just have to hunt. The problem is you have to hunt around for them. I think the biggest thing that, can, that we can do is have a block repo where you can search for blocks inside the editor instead of having to, because now you have all these plugins that are like, buy my plugin, I'll give you 500 blocks, or buy my plugin, I'll give you 1,000 blocks. And that's just adding more weight for something that should be native. So you can do it, but you have to like, search for all of these things, and that's the challenge. You're talking about the templates though, right? Then they have yeah, like the templates, so you can yeah. see different yeah. styles. I mean, there are, there are, there are, there are, there are good, like, Gutenberg templates now as well. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Are they just not one good spot though? No. I just think they're